Well, Paul Tillich, a theologian who died in 1965, was in the middle of the 20th century considered the most dangerous theologian alive. He was an immigrant from Germany uh, during the Second World War. He claims he was the first, or others say at least one of the first, uh, non-Jewish intellectuals to stand up to the Nazis. He was thankfully read by somebody at Union Theological Seminary in New York City at the time, and they were able to bring him over in 1933. He came at 47 years old on uh, across the waters with uh, without knowing English. And by the end of the 1950s, Time Magazine featured him as America's premier Protestant intellectual. And again, like I said, uh, he was considered the most dangerous theologian alive. And the reason for that is that Tillich, in the name of God, denies the existence of God. It's a really uh, fascinating uh, way of looking at the divine. And I first read him in college uh, and um, was struck by um, how affirmative he was when it came to the issue of religious doubt. He says, uh, serious doubt is a confirmation of faith. And that just hooked me. So beyond that, fairly prolific. And by the end of his life, very well known across the United States and has since cast an enormous influence on, on various theologians, uh, not least of whom was Martin Luther King. King wrote his dissertation on Tillich, uh, on Tillich's Doctrine of God. Tillich points out that if God is a being, conditioned or limited by time and space, then we're not talking about the true God. We're talking about God who exists somewhere out there. Uh, instead, what Tillich wants to argue is that God is not a being, but the depth and power of being itself. So what does that mean? It means that everything, there's a great line by a poet named uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins coming out of the Catholic tradition. He was a Jesuit. And he says at one point, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. So for Tillich, instead of God being up there, God uh, at the height of reality, God resides at the heart of reality, giving each moment its power to exist. So I think of it as a kind of like generator of being uh, that, that empowers everything to, uh, to stand out of God. And we share in that power. And faith is supposed to bring that sharing to conscious expression. So when I talk about, say, Paul Tillich indirectly in a sermon, I use the other Paul, the Apostle Paul, who says, for example, in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Or again, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, a letter attributed to Paul, uh, the author talks about the inner strength of God dwelling within us. And so you're really looking at what nerds call a depth transcendence rather than a height transcendence. God is the transcendent essence of everything rather than a being who exists above everything. Tillich, at the very end of his third volume of the Systematics, he says, life is life in the eternal, life in God. This corresponds to the assertion that everything temporal comes from the eternal and returns to the eternal. And it agrees with the Pauline vision, they're referring to the Apostle Paul, that in ultimate fulfillment, God shall be everything in or for everything. One could call this symbol eschatological panentheism, which is to say that all things are, are from God, all things exist by the power of God, uh, such that God is in all things, and then all things uh, in terms of the being that they share with God return to God. Um, so uh, uh, Paul says it much more concisely, the other Paul that is, the Apostle Paul, it's in Romans 11, and I find this helpful. He says, verse 36, for from him, God, and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So we have these hints throughout the New Testament of God more as a kind of indwelling reality 
Uh, Luther calls, refers to God at one point as the inmost reality of all things. That totally flips on its head popular, the popular understanding of God as a being up there or out there. Could Tillich be considered a universalist? I've often heard that he is, and I think there is some basis for that. He says that uh, he says two things about the about uh, eternal life. Uh, one is that this that self consciousness cannot be excluded from eternal life. So there is something within us, not a soul, but something within us that consciousness, that being that belongs to God and returns to God. And what fascinates me about the end of his life is that Tillich seems to come to a point where there is an actual reciprocal relationship between God and world. Whereas you don't see that so much in his earlier writing, but in the end of his systematic theology, he writes, time not only mirrors eternity, that's from Plato, it contributes to eternal life in each of its moments. So what Tillich seems to be suggesting is that there is a relationship and that you might think of it this way, that each moment uh, uh, contributes and enriches the divine life uh, such that at the end of our lives, the entirety of our moments of uh, these moments are somehow taken up into God. Um, the other thing is, he says, the self-conscious self in eternal life is not what it is in temporal life. And I love this. He says, the continuation of consciousness as we know it now is more an image of hell than it is of heaven. And I've thought that ever since I was a kid. I mean, what do you do in heaven after 300 years and you've played all your Xbox games or you've watched all your favorite movies or you've read all the books you want to read? There seems to be a kind of monotony that's implied there after a point. And what Tillich wants to say is that, no, that's, that's not what eternal reality is. Eternal reality is the, the being within us that we share each moment that is collected by God and brought back to God, um, rather than uh, the soul within us simply being transported to another dimension also conditioned by time. There is something of us, this, this essence of us, this, this being that that we have from God that returns to God, not at the end, but each moment. So each moment is enriching the divine life. He calls this the process of essentialization. If that's true, then none of us would be excluded from participating in, in the divine life that way. I was told some years back by a former student of Tillich that he was pressed by his students to answer the question of life after death. And he gave them this single sentence. He says this, love holds on. Love holds on. There's something of um, love as one of the ways we talk about God. And indeed, if there is something of God in each of us, as well as in all things, then that something is held on by God. That's a very figurative way to put it. But it reminds me of what Paul says, the other Paul in Romans 8, and that is there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So the love that indwelled in him is actually a love that indwells in all things because all things share in the being of God. And that sharing uh, suggests that we return somehow to the being of God. And I think that's a powerful message. And I think to myself, well, then everything that has being shares in this love, knowingly or not. So was Tillich a universalist? I would say by implication, absolutely. Absolutely. That there is, uh, that if indeed there is something of the divine in all of us, and that something returns to its source after each of us as individual beings die, then yes, nothing is excluded. Um, and, and Tillich, refers somewhat frequently to a theologian named Origen, who talks this way about the restitution of all things or about the, the salvation of all people and all reality. And I think all of it kind of is predicated on this idea that because we share in the being of God, we somehow return to God and no one ultimately is excluded from that return. One of the things that I hope is that 
people can see how Tillich is part of a genealogy that goes back through Luther and the mystics to the Apostle Paul that thinks about God in a way that's plausible, compelling, and perhaps perspective widening. And that's something that I just have loved about his theology. And it's so fascinating. It's like then turning back on the tradition and shining a flashlight on certain things that suddenly appear like gems in, in the darkness. And again, one of those was Martin Luther talking about God as the inmost reality of all things, or St. Augustine talking about God as closer to us than we are to ourselves, or the Apostle Paul talking about God as that in which we live, move, and have our being, or even outside of the Christian tradition going to Islam, the notion that God is closer to us than we are to our jugular vein, the source of our of our life and being. So it's a really, it, it, um, I call it intracosmic transcendence, the idea that instead of looking up beyond the universe to God, we find God as the depth and power source of each moment we have. And that for me is a, is a really incredible way, in a good sense, uh, of thinking about the sacred. The, uh, so to, I guess to return to the first quotation I shared, the world is charged by the grandeur of God, and Paul Tillich gives us a lens through which to see the charge.